Hello everyone, today we talk about Marshal Vauban, Sébastien Leprestre de Vauban, Marshal of France, by the way, 1633-1707, arguably uh, the most uh, important military engineer in the history of mankind, uh, surely among the the top ones, uh, with such an illustrious career that um, doesn't even make sense just to, to list today again, right? Today we rather take a look introductively because we are just beginning. When I say introductively, it's not because the channel is about introductions, right? The channel is about getting started and then getting into medias res. Uh, and we must always at some point take the first step uh, for, for each topic, right? And today we discuss, in fact, the one of the profound to say the least, impact that Vauban's system had on the development of siege, warfare, and fortification, surpassing, again, some say, all oh, other individuals in history, in, in this regard. Again, it's debatable, but this is also not what we're looking at today. Today we look at the essentials of the system and how, in fact, Vauban's groundbreaking works in stone and earth coupled with his published treatises, exerted this profound influence on the conduct of war during his lifetime, uh, practically, concretely, right? Um, as you know, his work consisted in essentially not just the the art of fortification, so in, in a defensive sense, but also in an offensive one, the one of siegecraft proper and how to storm or take, in any case, a fortress. In a time in history in which, as we will see better now, and we have already discussed in some other video, um, warfare had come to staticize to some degree, right? There are some sort of sinusoidal trends in the art of war regarding these um, these speeds, right? And albeit we are at the beginning of the, of the 18th century, at the latest, still, the fortress does constitute a, a very um, bulky uh, obstacle that is not even that um, far in hostility to medieval times. And here, as you know, it's a medievalist speaking. A medievalist also spent a lot of... You know, I, I will uh, read part of my uh, work on, say, siege warfare, or at least the comprehensive art of war analysis that I they made my 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 period let's say so the uh, fortress and defensive lines that Vauban constructed in northern France in the Netherlands so in literally the hottest frontier in terms of forces concentration and general activity of the time enabled France to resist the collective might and essentially counterattack of Europe from 1675 to 1750. As we have explained countless times, and again I made multiple videos on the Grand Siècle, and these are sort of further, again, leaps forward in that direction, France, under the Sun King, had essentially become the inspirationally, um, once again, because historically that's also how it had behaved. Say, medieval times, uh, in the Renaissance, etc. And now again, the um, continentally hegemonic power uh, which, uh, in Europe, which means that essentially most of the other European powers were practically invested in coalizing to stop French uh, expansion, but also counter-striking some point threatening the the same Paris and the same future of the Bourbon um, rule, so that Vauban's energies were definitely very contributive to the same uh, French uh, statehood, right? Der derivatively from from war, the man was incredibly active. He uh, uh, supervised the, the, the construction of uh, 300 or 300 fortifications were also in invested in uh, civilian works 
some canals are still used right from from his time as a testament to his uh, mastery of engineering but he was also um like for example and um, he was interested in economy as obviously this enormous chain of defense that basically began to, to shelter france against all the various um enemies in the, the various fronts right uh, would would entail of course, the enormous um expenses right uh, he uh, was essentially a burgundian he earned his trust if he started with conde then he uh, changed side with, with the royalists and uh, he was noticed by mazzarino who essentially gave him a commission in the french army and from there like his fortune um uh, under louis the, the 14th and the title of, uh, of marshal of france he participated to the french academy of science just uh, uh, ad honorem given that um given, given his enormous exploit in the fields of, of architecture of, you know of engineering of, of ballistics of you know mathematics you know applied physics and so on and um Vauban's innovative techniques uh, would remain in fact the cornerstone of european fortifications and siege craft throughout the 18th century right the uh, say military engineering in fr- from the renaissance had spoken italian from the 18th century it spoke french thanks to vauban and also other you know uh, experts in uh, in siege warfare both frederick the great and his contemporaries held marshal vauban in the highest esteem recognizing him as the preeminent siege master of his generation now during the wars of reed 14 no military commander could realistically expect to achieve significant victories without a deep understanding of siege craft this is in many ways true uh like also in the previous centuries but um, at this point um the latter's art um was evolving towards as you know more a greater concentration of power which sun king's france was the most perfect embodiment uh, of the era um and this was particularly evident in which the by, by the scale of the territorial acquisitions like the french expansion was especially again the, this mover of much of the um, say innovation and uh, as we've seen uh, from from the other side as a counter of the of warfare as much as essentially the primary objective in just strategically in a general sense um, and since the renaissance of course fortresses had uh, mirrored the um, development in uh, statehood in uh, in the concentration of strategic forces becoming ever more effective larger and um, in this sense capable of um, say becoming the cornerstones of properly the provincial domination of a particular uh, area thus the capture or loss of a fortress at this point had in um, in absolute terms if anything increased right uh, in importance the same system had been increasing in uh, in absolute terms so the the relativity of it can be debated but the capture or loss of a fortress served as the most reliable gauge of essentially a general strategic prowess and competence because once you had taken one of these strongholds you could essentially uh, maintain a control of province unless somebody uh, would uh, come back trying to get this gigantic enterprise Today we do not talk about, say, 17th, uh, 18th century art of war. We have, again, already seen it in also in some depth uh, as far as siege warfare is concerned in other videos. We will come back on them, but it's important to understand at least contextually how the system had been working, because by the 90s of the 17th century, as we were saying at the beginning, fortresses still retained many features reminiscent of of medieval castles proper and also a similar role uh, strategically 
However, to counter the growing potency of artillery, two significant changes had occurred in fortress design, mostly thanks to the innovation of the Italian military architects and engineers. France had been quite there, very much obsessed, um, especially during the Renaissance, about anything uh, Italian involved. Um, and his Italian uh, advisors, uh, engineers, etc., were practically present everywhere, like up to the far east of, you know, the Moscovy. Um, and they, uh, let's say that France and Italy in this had a quite interesting tandem. You know, if, um, let's say ultimately Italian wars were won, as you know, by the by the Habsburgs. Essentially, France was the the country more. Um, concentrated statehood and so could still grasp right and um enough to invest uh, seriously into into this military engineering especially uh, in the time of louis the 14th right compared to the the austrians uh, especially also to an extent the, the, the spanish now the major changes uh, as you know this trace uh, uh, italienne were uh, the walls constructed lower and thicker, and the entire fortress partially buried underground. And the say physical reason being obvious, right? The, the tactical purpose of fortifications like this was to uh, hinder attacking infantry, while providing a minimal target for enemy artillery. As a result, the fundamental design of a fort evolved into this low earthen wall reinforced with stone accompanied by a deep ditch in front of it right enough to break of course massive formations like just putting themselves into that like offering minimal uh, target as we've seen for uh, for enemy artillery that had been smashing all those previous, previously uh, and vertically developing uh, medieval castles. Right? This was the most obvious solution. This design was uh, enhanced by the addition of a sloping embankment extending from the exterior of the ditch uh, to the level of the surrounding countryside. And this feature, known as the glassy, created a clear field of fire for the fort's cannons and the garrison's muskets, sloping down, so facilitating in many ways the, the task, um, of the besieged because they could simply shoot down as this uh, the enemy was just down below and in case uh, uh, say marching up the glasses um, that presented an additional challenge to siege artillerists as the slope made it difficult to accurately determine even the proper elevation required to strike the main walls of the fort that had all a structure so behind, depending, of course, all, nothing came out, let's say, so standardized. In fact, there were many experiments that, in the wake of which, sort of, Vauban grafts um, his work on. And um, yet there was this need of homogenization, especially in a time of the 14th, just to have a, just with, like with the army, as we've seen just recently, um, sometimes slower in a... Um, for example, in a technological sense, as far as we've seen um, the, the development of particular um, musketry fire doctrines, etc. But as far as fortifications, especially because of this sort of open France that, yes, is very aggressive, um, is very arrogant, is very ambitious, but in this sense, like this, does not really have many boundaries, right, from, from the continental side, right? So, had to form a court and that that was naturally always to, to assist an army right because fortifications alone do not do the, the job especially in this such such a based um, territory um, uh, and a, as a consequence Vauban's strongholds were designed with uh, a standard layout in principle yet also in this case each one was adapted to harmonize with the surrounding terrain and so exploiting all the advantages that this would provide you can see this from the the pictures here like if you're talking about uh, the netherlands everything is 
tending to be radiant, specular. If you look at the Alps, it's just they, they look much more like the older um, medieval castles. But actually, you could find, uh, say, of course, the, the counter element in there if there was, I don't know, a, a river crossing with a uh, with a meandrum, like you would have to adapt a fortress in the same way. There are some fortresses um, uh, in, in the Alps that are extremely uh, innovative and, um, in fact, even more insidious than the, the fortifications had historically uh, ever been. Now, the central defense of Vauban's fort was a the star trace, which had been the, the geometrical pattern used also during the uh, Tras Italien, but the way it was um, drawn, of course, was ever more complex, um, with an arrangement of alternating bastions and curtain walls. The bastions were gun emplacements that protruded from the main walls, providing defenders with a flanking fire capability around the entire fortress. The original point of this was, of course, like preventing the enemy. Uh, coming from the outer side uh, in general and wanting to, to maximize the um, hit a close range, not um, finding a perpendicular wall to smash in, and having to change position and therefore also distancing himself from the, the actual uh, target. And uselessly so, because at that point, like the, the more perpendicular the wall presented itself the the more it was to smash into because it was just like the tip of that star um, and and you could create of course from the the same bastions when the enemies would have finally tried to assault the fortification of course uh, a terrifyingly enfilade fire just from the, the outer um, the outer defenses um, midway along the main wall, a protected path known as the Cordon position offered a secure route for the defenders as well that would have not been exposed, like um, moving uh, instead uh, within this protected, fortified internal lines. Uh, efficiently designed right, to deliver forces rapidly each to each um, endangered, momentarily endangered side of the of the wall. From there the stone-faced wall or scarp descended to the bottom of the ditch. Right? And that of course was pretty steep. The ditch was typically six meters deep up to 27 wide and often filled with water. Secondary combinations of wall and ditch along the curtain walls, known as Redan, de Milun, or Ravelin, provided additional flanking fire and protection to the main walls. The Redan is essentially a V-shaped salient angle towards the expected attack, uh, and uh, it developed from the lunette in turn, it was originally a half moon shape outwork, right? And so, with the, with shorter flanks, it became a redan, right? The lunette um, is called like this because it has the the half moon shape, um, and uh, the the gorge was generally um, open. And the demi lune uh, ravelin, as it came to be better known later, um, is essentially this triangular um, protrusion. Uh, or detached outwork sometimes it could be connected even with just a mobile structure. It was the case also like in some medieval fortresses. We, we will be seeing them um, better at some point uh, for the medieval siege series. Uh, located, in fact, in front of the inner works of, of the fortress. So the, the curtain walls or, or, the, or, the, or the bastions. Um, and uh, so the Durabland, the the million is placed outside the castle and opposite uh, a fortification curtain wall. And of course, it's buying you a lot of um, time and an advantage it creates to a great price. It's more exposed, admittedly. But here, in fact, it's also completely integrated in the 
in the main wall um, structurally, which of course adds to, to solidity of the wall. And so all the, these features were connected to the main fortification uh, in case also by easily destroyed wooden bridges spanning the ditch, as we were saying before. And, and on the outer side of the ditch, the hunter's carp was also faced with stone and often featured a hidden gallery underneath to facilitate concealed movement. Um, so you have all this internal interconnection as different layers of defense that buy time, internally and externally. At the top of the counter scarp was another position, similar to the aforementioned cordon, called the covert way, right from which defenders could rake the glass seed with musketry fire. Imagine how an ant's musketry fire was as the glass seed descended to the surrounding countryside from which the enemy was, was rising up the, the earthwork. Uh, Vauban uh, advocated for detached forts, redouts, and, and other supplementary structures to enhance the depth of the weaker areas within the fortress, which kind of makes sense because it allows to just space out and sort of increase the, um, say the, the, the time at least that the enemy is going to take to secure those areas under fire um, immediately and at at the closest range, um, so at least buying time, preventing him to eventually attack in that point. Every fortress has to be attacked from a side that is uh, the, the the one that hopefully is also the, the strongest one, but that, that eventually offers the you know the best um, uh, the best chance right uh, for for storming the fortress in the first place. Um, and the cook the the first like uh, say duty of a, of a of a commander during sieges was to properly understand what this fortress was made of constitutively from mostly the men uh, defending it that um, could be overall few but that amplified of course the resistance to their um, uh, to the advantage provided by defense and further uh, amplified by the same fortifications and how these were essentially uh, to be gradually grinded. The relative strength of a fortress depended thus on the layers of outer works protecting the main fortification. The combination of ditch and wall could be increased indefinitely, with each additional layer adding approximately 275 meters to the depth of the fortress. The extent to which the fortifications of Lille, the second city of France after Paris, by the way, and located in fact on the northeastern frontier, could be compounded was reflected by the extensive defensive measures implemented by uh, Louis XIV and Sébastien Le Prestre de Vauban. Lille was surrounded by broad double moats that were filled with water. The moats were flanked by massive earthworks and masonry structures that reinforced an intricate system of outer defenses, including detached forts, covered ways, and galleries. This impressive array of defenses alone made Lille a top-notch fortress, a might to be reckoned with just by this outer defenses. However, within the city laid also a second wholly independent fortress which was designed to provide effect with an, an additional layer of protection for the inhabitants. Uh, in August 1708, as you know, the Allied armies of John Churchill, Duke of Marlborough and Prince Eugene of Savoy laid siege to Lille. The operation was the largest of its kind since the introduction of gunpowder. Um, so also quite a new, like in its kind, you do, do not know how it's going to go until you do it historically, right? Um, you have a combined force from the Allied side of approximately 15,000 soldiers. After two months of intense bombardment and siege warfare, the 15,000 men 
French garrison surrendered the outer walls that had become untenable. And with those also the city that lay within, let's stress again, the, the second largest in France, but also retreated to the second citadel fortress where they continued to hold out until December. Now, this was, the, the siege of Lille came at a significant cost to the Allied forces that reported approximately 11,000 casualties. Right? So, a third of these, by the way, had occurred during a single night assault on the city. Right? And this won Vauban the, the saying that essentially he had managed to win a campaign with, with this fortress alone, right? Um, the fall of Lille was not definitely the end of France or whatever. Like, while there were 15,000 Frenchmen defending the city, there were something like 100,000 in the vicinity, just like the Allies were not just, you know, the, the force that literally destroyed itself um, attacking the, um, you know, the, the fortress. But in this sense... And, and managing to capture it, but um, uh, its entire system. But if you count, of course, the French losses, 7,000 casualties, right? Also surrendering hundreds of guns, but from the Allied side, like we're talking 100,000 men in all, right? And say 13 from the 16 in terms of casualties, you realize, right, that the fact that at that point was nothing more could be done on that campaign. And so, by there were many other fortresses of this kind, also not just as, uh, you know, in, in such larger cities, but, in fact, France was, was very big anyway, so the, the, the size there is just in relative terms to Paris, you know, the, the, the wall of the thing. And we talked about siege warfare in the von Krieger series abundantly to show exactly uh, what a pain in the behind literally the um, uh, uh, fortress left by right while you are continuing your advance actually does especially when you look at this massive armies of the war of Spanish succession that had no logistical capacity but to essentially stop at each one of these fortresses not always, depending on which one they were, but let's say um, appropriately to the, the greater fort. Like the greater the fort, the the easier it is actually to wear out the enemy um, through uh, the the harassment of his uh, supply lines and all this kind of thing. So Vauban had thought this, uh, you know, carefully, and the, as we've seen the this chain of fortresses protecting France had that deeply strategical, not just, you know, material, uh, um, static function that you can imagine. Right? Because there were always these massive armies um, revolving around the sieges, also in reserve, as the major reserve. Now, um, Sebastien Vauban, renowned for his expertise in the design and the construction of forts, also mastered the art of capturing them. And actually, this is sort of the, maybe not in the field, underrated, but say the aspect that uh, we tend to say, don't think just like you build, he built fortresses, so he was just mostly about like a, a, a defensivist. No, actually he mastered the art of, of storming. Uh, making capitulate the fortresses, um, for which he was also more, let's say, more renowned. Really. His writings on siege craft and uh, are extensive as detailed, and drew on his extensive experience on both sides of the ramparts. Imagine having literally, you know, spent your entire life building the most advanced fortifications of the time, like just by attacking the enemy ones that often were not as, uh, let's say, uh, updated, because they belonged to powers that had been put together, say, more, more recently, and just with fortifications maybe existed there from, from centuries and centuries, but that had not had that um, uh, enormous, again, state to finance them, especially in a 
collective sort of strategic fashion, that well, that would give you uh, a pretty concrete, palpable, plastic idea of, based on your own knowledge of how a fortress should be built. How can that fortress, without most of what you would have optimally um, established there, could resi resist? Vauban conducted no less than 53 sieges throughout his career. And, and this is really normal for the generals of the time when you compare it to field battles that were fundamentally rare. We made a video about uh, Maurice de Saxe and we compared him also to the same Marlborough of this um, this era. Um, and of course, it was normal like for you know major engagements in open field to be rare because they would also at that point trying to settle matters in sort of more direct and risky right uh, gambling bold way whereas the fortress was okay we'll have just to sit here to resolve properly a timing that you're already aware of in though uh, of course that's also when the, the armies can decide to confront each other to try to get it over with the war because of the enormous costs of the same because of the political pressure and so on and so we will hopefully look more and more often also at the strategy of these times just the politics the history of now despite acknowledging that ultimately any fortress would fall if of course properly hammered Vauban believed that the art of siege craft was essential uh, unavoidable the task of besieging a fortress successfully much less doing it economically was a formidable challenge a siege typically began with the uh, investment of the, the fortress uh, isolating it from all outside communication and effectively sealing the garrison within the walls this is true for any era right it doesn't make any sense to besiege a place that can't be resupplied constantly right uh, and especially at this time, which fortifications normally hold out, right, even with much lesser uh, forces, right? The case of Lille, for example, we've seen before, it was one of a massive uh, defense for, in fact, such a large city, which was not that normal um, at all. But there were some positions that were nearly impregnable uh, in um, uh, some very, say, more, more typically more actually remote and thus also relatively less strategically relevant in the first place uh, locations. But that thus could be like just an insanity to besiege. Um, so here, uh, as you understand, we're talking mostly about Flanders and so well, the major battlefield um, of the time. Um, the, mm, let's say the the isolation of the besieged fortress was usually accomplished by large forces of cavalry and mounted infantry who would deny the garrison access to any usable resources or supplies surrounding the works. And this obviously makes a lot of sense before the arrival of the main force because, um, say, more flexible troops, such as, in fact, cavalry or mounted infantry, could carry out hit-and-run tactics coming from a larger force, so sort of denying the enemy to sensibly come out to forage uh, the surroundings and gradually take battering them down inside the, uh, uh, the, the fortress. Once the investment had thus been completed, the chief engineers would study the fortress layout and defenses because they had to literally plan what the like all the, the counter wall and that was developing as a measure like also for the, the extent of such um, fortresses like for the first time at this point um, at least by this scale, I made recently a video about for example the siege of Vienna in 1683 that in many ways um, had lacked actually a counter wall from the Ottoman side, which was a thing that in Flanders in these years had already become from from a couple of decades uh, pretty much the habit, like the good the, the, the good practice. And plus it was about, say, laying this camp out well, because if you made a mistake, you would have endangered not just like the, the entire expanse for, for it, but 
much more, incomparably more with the army's success, the, the entire strategic endeavor. Um, and in, in the meantime, the main Besiegian force would establish camps and parks located beyond the range of the fortress's cannon, typically between 550 and 910 meters uh, away. This was also really typical in the in the practice, just the distances from the walls were changing. Normally this was um, um, caused by the fact that the normal mortar cannon range, like at least uh, with a degree of, let's say, the, the useful range and the one that could be accepted in terms of cost-benefit ratio of the troops and the kind of pressure you could put on the enemy. As a result, a large proportion of the infantry would become full-time excavators in the process, tasked with digging trenches and approaching positions to facilitate a successful assault on the fortress. All those troops there doing nothing uh, were better used as labor force and digging the trenches, um, gradually approaching the the enemy battlements that would have been at that point object of the assault by the same troops that would have had to know in that sense how to move where to took the same pride from creating the, the trenches. Think about the 1692 siege of Namur in which the same D'Artagnan was killed. It is the same one of Tristram Shandy by Stern, like of Uncle Toby, like, do you want to see where I was hit? All right. That's a funny scene. But it, it does stem from, from the adventures in that case, in fact, of the English in the Grand Alliance against France. And this terrible bloodbath of the Seven Years' War that in many ways were like brought these all these powers at some point to say, okay, well, okay, so let's slow down, let's invent some, something more functional than these literally hundreds of thousands of men on the field that we can't even properly maneuver in that. We will just lose wearing them out against these massive fortresses. Um, now, the laborers working in shifts commenced constructing the earthen walls and redoubts of the contravallation lines. These trenches, which completely encircled the fortress for the obvious purpose of not allowing the enemy to get any supplies from the outer side, served as a secure base of operations for the besiegers as well, enabling them to mount a defense against any potential sortie from the fort, which was always like the, the normality, like if you study again from ancient medieval times like the ultimate purpose like if you had any sensible amount of manpower to hope to, to break um, the siege considering that in defense you would have had still uh, I mean there was so much you could defend um, uh, from from the walls with with a certain amount of, of men right and and that stopped because uh, like at best like the other men would have just stayed stayed uh, within and not would have not been deployable on the walls. So, yes, they could put up a resistance and increase, like, the attrition, but the best uh, was very often to attack with a sortie at night, taking the enemy by surprise, because they would have not, the, the enemy would have not been lined up for battle, so there was a risk in that in that regard. Uh, well, the, the sortie uh, parties would, right? So they could uh, destroy, damage the, this whole thing, kill, uh, weaken the enemy. So, also... Normally, this in the expectation of some relief force being put together, and so making say the enemy ever more invested in the the encirclement while weakening himself in front of an incoming enemy. So that's what we're actually saying before regarding the actually the siege of Vienna, as well that the Ottomans wouldn't bother themselves to deploy their troops in a way that would also create an outer wall of defense towards the incoming enemy. Also because most of their forces, also some of the finest ones, the, the Janissaries, were into the trenches, digging, right? And, and this depended also on the kind of infantry and their specialty. In that case, the Janissaries had been sort of kind of Stolstrup and experts by, by some degree, also with mining, counter mining, also um, part of, of the story. Today, we, we don't descend properly in especially the artillery, the explosive side of the story, but that was also one for this. We will partially see it. Um, 
But as we were saying, um, the say if an enemy field army was detected to be maneuvering in the vicinity, a second line of trenches would be dug to protect against the army's approach with the intention, of course, of thwarting any potential relief effort on behalf of the besieged fort, which, of course, was a was yet another great feat to pull off because very often these armies were, say, overly stretched around the, uh, the, the fortification. That was actually the point as well, that for how great your advantage in numbers for besieging a fortress as it normally was the precondition of this like since the beginning because you know you don't besiege a place that has a substantial advantage um in uh, let's say compared to yours but i guess we were saying before at lille for example they're mostly equal forces um and they're deployed just in a certain way um but the idea is that even if you have an advantage you are uh dispersing these forces that technically are the army that yes is denying through these for surrounding this, this uh, counter wall the the possibility of the enemy to simply uh say break through like even if they again come out in good order first of all you you would have some time at least to uh, to notice that and so deploying yourself adequately um, but that um, in this sense do not leave too much space for a full array of those same troops out there that also can't quite simply come all out uh, and risk everything in just that closed space that would have been sort of suicidal right uh, as we've seen the same contravalation distances were designed to exactly create this like uh, ease for the uh, besieger that would have not been harassed importantly by the fortress artillery at least counting on the overall strategic superiority in numbers also for artillery uh, that is not that they can be deployed in fact in 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 the same fortresses to an important degree that Vauban would also take care of but that it's not like you know creating a battery in open field and, and or concentrating so many guns in a just narrow space which you cannot do um, from a fortress um, but the problem was again that this enormous force around the perimeter was st overly stretched uh, for any possibility of it simply you know uh, coping with um, a, a relief force of say comparable extent that would come to of course sort of destroy it immediately in that regard. so it was at least you, you needed these reserves outside, as we've seen with the siege of Lille, strategically, properly outside the siege itself. And so this tells you also why these sieges were so extremely expensive. Um, aside from all the investment that, as we've seen, uh, had been carried out just to build the same fortresses uh, in Inchipit, let's say. According to Vauban, guidelines this preliminary work was expected to be completed within a period of nine days only however in most cases this time frame was likely an underestimate given the complexity and scope of the task and in spite of all you would have not needed to, to, to rush uh, so much about this because there were literally more important factors but to consider but Vauban was at least wanting here to um, to dispose of already well trained um, troops who could simply um, adapt that quickly, ideally or intentionally to that rhythm, knowing what to do and doing it orderly, uniform now when the camp was reasonably secure the actual work of approaching the fortress through trenches would begin the engineers would select the weakest section of the fort and the heavy siege artillery would begin a relentless battering of the walls to form a breach through which an assault could be launched. Meanwhile, tunnels would be dug under the outer defenses, which could then be destroyed by explosive mines. The traditional method of approaching the main walls of a fort during a siege had always been through the use of zigzag trenches, referred to as SAP. Vauban, 
improved as a, like a great engineer this system by constructing additional trenches known as parallels which ultimately encircled the entire fort right some of the pictures are uploaded here are very say well representing that and that it could be enormous labyrinths like looking at them from like, and the the advantage of course was that um, that the parallels allowed for a greater deployment of troops and equipment while also dispersing the defending fire from within the fort so essentially applying as you see we described the same fortifications like the same principle of, of the bastions like with that uh, inclination and not to allow the, the enemy to to shoot into like the, the most um, uh, say precious part in this case it's as if you had thrown a, a a trench just parallel to the gun's trajectory you had made strike among the, the troops here within. Um, and it was all very risky anyway also because there were I don't know also explosive projectiles I think venturing to this uh, trenches was not uh, something you, you wanted to do if you cared too much about your your survival <laughs> in general but uh, as you go to war of course you must take your own risks um, typically, three parallels were constructed, but in some cases more were necessary rather than being uh, an option. The first parallel was a large trench, approximately 150 meters uh, from the main wall, and it housed most of the siege cannons and mortars that, as we were saying before, were also sort of bit this first uh, line of... of uh, of stout like lots of defense from 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 the walls like could simply help um, uh, suppressing the defenders fire uh, from this location the saps were advanced towards the fort in the zigzag pattern to prevent the defenders from firing directly into the trenches uh, the sappers responsible for digging these trenches protected themselves with a large earth filled wicker baskets called gabion and the sappers primarily worked at night um, due to obvious reasons, although a nighttime sortie by the garrison was a common tactic employed by the defenders, as we've seen, to delay the siege and typically capturing lots of people that were sort of scattered without order uh, within the trenches that could be cleared by a more compact force like storming them uh, with ease, right? Because the, the guys were, were just working there, right? And they would just shelter themselves also from the from the enemy fire through those through the same earth that were carrying out of the same uh, tunnels so that's uh, as ketonic as it sounds midway between the first parallel and the glassy a second one a parallel was dug and equipped with a so-called breaching battery that comprised cannons as well and and as the saps were advanced closer to the glassy that this was done naturally you know through advancing like your firepower so gradually suppressing the enemy defenses in the process what we were saying before about the uh, the overall advantage of, of the attacker in that sense the trenches were gradually sharpened as we were saying before to minimize the effect of increasing defending fire because Yes, the zigzag thing was useful, but um, let's say there was a sort of risk uh, acceptance uh, that uh, entailed just literally creating more straighter lines towards the the fortress um, that would have saved time and uh, in that sense also energies of work, for which at some point in that context, like even the loss of some life was not proportioned that much of a deal right said the closest of course the trenches were the 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 more say parallel of course to the to the enemy fortress uh, say to the enemy walls uh, it was now at the foot of the glassy that as we've seen was literally the launching pad for any uh, possible assault unless you manage to sort of break uh, like to make great parts of the defenses explode with the mines etc a third parallel 
was constructed, from which further mining efforts were made, in fact, against the outer defenses and the main walls. And in this stage, the sappers' work was often interrupted by the same countermining efforts conducted by whomever was within the garrison, mostly volunteers. Uh, some situations were really desperate. We've seen it um, well, again, in the series about the siege of Vienna, um, where there were lots of tricks also to, to spot, let's say, where the enemy was working. So medieval times, like the typical things like putting a bucket of water, seeing if the, uh, where say, it, it began to, uh, to move more, uh, more evidently, because somebody was working underneath the, the, the pavement. Um, now, typically, by this point, uh, a portion of the main wall had been already destroyed or severely damaged. This was also normal, right? The resulting rubble uh, would partially fill the ditch, so also help the, the attackers, but still it could, it was like not a flat entrance um, to the settlement, so also these breaches would be, as you know, defended by, especially defended by better defenders with men, and so that's where things started getting more, say, concentratedly bloody. Now, the main walls would uh, eventually gap open, right? So, like, if that, again, uh, manpower discrepancy exists, it doesn't matter how tough it had been to attack uh, the, uh, the fortress up to this point, you would have managed to pour your uh, remaining superior forces into the uh, walls, like and the um, hastily improvised defenses installed to fill these gaps would have been overrun. And once the besiegers had firmly esta established themselves amidst the rubble of the outworks uh, in front of a significant breach in the main wall. The, cri uh, the crisis of the siege was, was at hand. Given this intense stretching to the trenches, the besieging army faced, until this point, uh, significant logistical challenges. Providing, for example, a steady supply of ammo alone was a monumental logistical undertaking. That's, as we were saying before, like the some trenches in the outer parts were not that, um, let's say, concealed through, through the angle. Um, from enemy fire, because it, it would have added a massive strain to the possibility of successfully supplying the troops. It's just like, I don't know, during World War I, like it would, I like to say, No Man's Land was an incredibly long uh, way, right? And it wasn't even much about breaking the, say, the, the first uh, layer of defenses. Normally, trenches were stormed, right? And the myth that, again, every person getting their head out of the trench being shot in the head itself and or like oh my god a machine gun could take down hundreds of people normally like the, there is a level of parity in a strategical sense by scale with the same things but the problem was that when you had taken this first layer of defense you had to carry all the supplies to by the way a spent fighting force already across this difficult terrain. So everything was that complicated. That's why also these trench systems were so complex. Um, because generally speaking, even if you know an enemy, enemy hadn't had to specifically fire into an air, if you had sort of dug trenches everywhere and so close one another, it was just like gradually smashing all the same structure, the same uh, dirt uh, walls between one and another. So it was actually an incredibly complicated undertaking. You had to feed the 30,000 strong siege team that had to be into the trenches as well, transporting the timber and the equipment necessary for the massive uh, effort, because, uh, again, the trenches would be damaged, it was just observed. Um, other aspect, like the siege uh, had also to contend with the unpredictability of the weather, right? The the, the same natural defenses of the fort, which included often rocky terrain that proved, of course, to be a significant obstacle, as well as the frequent sorties launched by the garrison, as we've seen, aimed at undoing 
the same progress made by the besiegers over the past week. This this is true uh, for all ages. If you look at um, I don't know medieval times, the sorties attack uh, battery ramps, right, siege towers that were in very costly in those uh, conditions even to build, right. And and so all these problems were understandably a major concern for a siege commander. According to Vauban, a siege typically would take, say, between 40 and 60 days, at least from the initial investment to, to the assault. Um, and also in this case, uh, Vauban was probably also deliberately underestimating the time required. In 1702, Marlborough spent 122 days besieging Lüttich, demonstrating the variability of siege timelines. Once the assault was imminent, the problem shifted to the commander of the garrison. His commanders in this era were not really just losing their men's lives for no reason. If, uh, yes, armies were bigger, there was some sort of more expandability of, of the individual soldiers, as we observed in, in some videos. Um, but overall, if um, there was no hope of relief or of resisting the same assault, um, the commander would usually opt to surrender the fort rather than risk having their garrison slaughtered and the city looted, by the way, because there were some terms at least that could be negotiated. Now, if the garrison chose to surrender and had defended their position with gallantry and spirits, they would be granted even the honors of war. This was typical at the time. It was still a very almost medieval minded reality in which the nobility ran uh, the game and there was all a sense of, of, of respect and parity um, especially like in this great engagements like in Europe there was all a sensitivity to, to things like I don't know for example the, the bombardment of Bruxelles was, was shocking for for many saying Louis XIV would regret that and even in the most terroristic endeavors there was some uh, episode of gallantry and conventionally recognized sense of status and of, of title, of position. Um, besides, like in war, like uh, fierce hatred alternates also with admiration. Um, now, in cases which things would, um, you know, go towards the recognition of the honor of, of the arms, the, it was very important traditionally because essentially it's as if you had been undefeated, like you had demonstrated your own valor, and at least you were, at least as a single commander, not uh, at least to be condemned for your current level of, you know, of, uh, say, your current hierarchical level compared to whomever had sent you there, that was ultimately the guy who had to deal with God for, for the defeat. Now, the besiegers would typically exchange the garrison's freedom for the control of the fort. And the garrison would march thus out with drums beating, colors flying, um, their bayonets fixed. Um, that is in America, but if you've watched the, the movie, like The Last of the Mohicans, like it's, uh, you know, there is a sort of an idea of what that could look like, even though it was not really carried out in the way that the movie shows. Um, anyway, um, and as a symbol of their defiance, um, by the way, the, the the garrison would clutch bullets in their teeth, so to show that they were ready to kill more, and so they had just made a favor to the uh, to the attackers for higher reasons rather than having lost their combativeness. Um, on, on the other hand, when the circumstances necessitated an assault, the besiegers would, uh, of course, reinforce their troops in the trenches by deploying additional forces for the attack. Um, some of these had to, find, to, to work as reserves, and you know there would be different waves launched uh, at a time. You must imagine how terrifying this, this seemed. Um, and led by the Grenadiers, especially, they would advance forward as a coordinated unit. The Grenadiers of the time wielded uh, primitive but effective hand grenades, uh, which were designed to inflict like that kind of damage 
to the enemy, the circumstances. These were assault uh, infantrymen. They had an important role also uh, in open field, but they very much had this um, edge in such kind of storming operation. Um, the other assault troops, typically infantrymen, would carry bundles of sticks known as fascines, which serve um, to fill in the ditch crossings uh, and facilitate movement across the fortifications. This was also a thing done since ever. And uh, it wasn't just about fascines, it was about, you know, finding also whatever you could find. There were planks, we've seen the Battle of Narba, we are in the same years. Um, there how the, the Swedish uh, attacked the, the Russian trenches, for example. Um, now, the defenders, however, would respond to the assault by raining down rocks, hand grenades, and musket balls on the assailants. If the assault failed to breach the defenses, it would often result in weeks of intense and brutal combat among the rubble and the debris uh, of the intricate fortification. A type of combat that bore some resemblance definitely to the trench war for World War I. This thing had been optimized, we were uh, remembering it before, by the Ottomans that literally carried out the same identical tactics of the Stolztruppen. First of all, they bombed um, like the, with, with artillery the fortifications and they blew up um, the mines and then they poured in the, uh, the Janissaries. Um, and here things happened pretty much um, in the same way, depending on on the, the situation, important was maintaining the temple, like the alternation of these hits uh, orderly. It was not less important than how, as we've seen also in, in a recent video, like that kind of rate of fire and cohesion and, and functionalization of musketry fire really was for for the for line infantry, because you could deliver the stuff like all uh, in diluted, right, or concentrated, and at parity of attack, you would uh, have respectively very different results. The most important thing was concentrating the attack, but as we've seen, that also put greater strain on logistics, so it was a, a veritable art that uh, the siege commanders of the time were to really master in a spectacular way to be, to be effective, right? And typically, uh, th this is generally evident at a political and strategic level with persist persistence and determination, the besiegers would eventually succeed in capturing the fort, right? If uh, an army had set their mind on one, like unless, again, a, a relief army arrived and tried the, the open field confrontation, the fortress would fall. Like, the, the point was... How relevant was that strategically? Kind of what time of the year that was? Like, so how long that would take? How much you could effectively pin those enormous forces at this point, even in the hundreds of thousands, just around that fortress? How much that would cost for the the coffers of these various states that year? And so, how much? How much? Uh, how much you were willing to lose yourself? Uh, and like in compared to the enemy as well. So again, one fortress was not falling was not the end of the world. Um, uh, the point is how much had you invested yourself in it, and the enemy could attack different places, different times. There were, uh, of course, great capacities of strategical projection in these fortresses, together always uh, and only with the the armies were effectively like the only way to pin the enemy and make him lose time to bulk down, uh, etc. Um, the garrison, exhausted and depleted by weeks of siege warfare, could no longer sustain themselves indefinitely. This is kind of obvious, as men, ammo and food supplies rapidly dwindled, the besiegers' relentless pressure would ultimately prove too much for the defenders to withstand. Now, while siege warfare was 
often preferable, as we've noticed, to pitch battles in the 17th and 18th centuries because it offered this capacity of delaying the major strategical confrontation for yet another year for which you could have provided uh, with yourself with adequate um, forces in both time for something that was overall much more important than, than a fortress by scale. It was nevertheless um, an exhausting, t time-consuming occupation uh, in itself. Right, it required immense resources, as we've seen, strategic planning, and no, no wonder that around sieges, still the art of war fundamentally revolved, and how rare, in fact, the uh, major confrontations were, but how still crucial sieges were for the same, and in a broader strategic sense. In many cases, a wall campaign would be spent attempting to capture a single fort or stronghold a testament to the complexity and challenge of siege warfare. However, as we pointed out already, this would have been the case only because there were massive enemy armies out there, right? If there hadn't been these, uh, even with all these forts garrisoned, without the possibility of putting together like an effective uh, field army to counter the invasion one, like, this force would have been completely useless, right? So it, it's not, again, the art of fortification does not develop simply as, again, a materially static sort of determined, um, uh, take passive defense that uh, is, is meant for no reason, just like filling this place. Uh, you, you don't create a barrier, right, physically, for an enemy that wants to break through, invade, and make a hell of a mess. The reason why these immense resources were invested in siege warfare was that there were massive armies that essentially used the fortifications as point de pu, bringing the enemy to wanting to seize them so that they would have secured a strong enough point, in fact, to project strategically further. In fact, trying, as we've seen, right, more often than not, to avoid a major open field confrontation. Right, it, it, it was doing this step by step without risking committing your forces to major maneuvers that could be that risky and that were always endangered in the first place by the presence of the fortifications that you could have simply not uh, leave behind you, um, especially when you have an army in front of you that can stop you while uh, those other forces are wearing out your communications, your supply lines. Um, uh, etc. That is going to essentially make literally the 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 land the earth melting um, under your feet, right? Not just behind that. It's a, destroying the same army. So we have seen what strategy is, what defense uh, and offense are in the von Krieger series. Watch that if you want to really understand how war works, because say history eventually tells you, but like. Von Clausewitz enucleates it in a great theory that he wasn't exposing just as a, as a general, but also as a great military historian, as a matter of fact. Um, so in the latter stages of Bon's career, he conducted an experiment in which he connected all these various forces he had built uh, that were, again, of another level, like compared to the previous ones, and that were in fact conceived strategically for the defense of France that was here also conceived probably in a geographical sense, uh, enucleated, like overlapping with with the country itself, which was not to be given for granted also because the same Vauban looking at uh, terrain simply said, look, there are some territories that we do not even need, right, in order to defend France, or at least that uh, we, have, we can't even leave out, even if we control them, because... At the end of the day, what's more important is to defend along this line, right? Um, and so he would make the experiment connecting the, his force together with a continuous network of field fortifications that um, would have had, in theory, uh, created some sort of continuous wall that evidently could have been, had to be meant anyway, uh, a dog, not like filling it with troops all along the frontier, but say, as we were saying, uh, before, uh, whenever the army would have been stationed, like in these operations in the frontier where warfare was 
was going on, you could have had some uh, result. In, in particular, Vauban hypothesized that if these lines were protected by a, the aforementioned mobile field armies, they would be virtually impenetrable. However, in this he was wrong. Uh, in the test, this innovative strategy ultimately proved unsuccessful. The lines of Brabant, as well as the vaunted Ne plus Ultra lines, so the ones that you will not basically just cross anyway, um, which Vauban had touted as an unassailable, were successfully bypassed by the Duke of Marlborough, who employed a clever tactic of feinting an attack in one direction, then launching a surprise assault at another point along the lines, which um, proved what we were saying before, that essentially without manning these um, fortifications, like the, they're, these are going to be useless as for anyone, and in there he was rather proving that, of course, like li lighter fortifications like these um, were just too thin and uh, say also given their extension un un unmanageable to the, to the point with, with a concentrated force that had to be mas masterfully employed like in this case like feigning a flight like concentrating other forces elsewhere also with a certain risk so that it took Marlborough to do that like it's not that Vauban had completely and uh, say, yeah, he was just inventing things out of, of, of nothing, um, but would essentially, at least this was an experiment that Vauban wanted to test himself, so uh, for the art of war at the time, let's say, um, this would have not worked, but if you think about it, um, isn't it something like the, like the continuous trenches from Switzerland to the North Sea of the First World War, like when, say, strategy um, and tactics would allow in fact that to happen which was a couple hundred years later um, things would produce themselves like that and what is fascinating in fact about Vauban that again today we haven't quite seen as a man that very often gives you also the dimension of um, same moral stature of, of the individual would keep on influencing um, the art of war especially as far as siege craft and fortification was concerned till well, the, the mid um, 19th century. Um, the significant sieges of the 18th, but also the ones later conducted by Wellington in Spain during the Peninsular War or the siege of Sevastopol in the Crimean War, we could look at these. Um, to some extent, even the siege of Petersburg in 1864 and Paris in 1871 were all rooted. Uh, in the methods pioneered by Vauban, that had truly reached that level of uh, international accomplishment as far as military engineering was concerned, so effectively surpassing the Trace Italienne and setting the standard also for essentially French uh, dominance, right? And like Vauban was the expression of Louis XIV at all those levels, and so an hegemonic power continentally has to provide this gigantic. Uh, uh, to say the least, right? It's something insane if you think about how many fortresses the, the guy actually built. Um, just it, it's utterly mind blow. But that's also, in fact, the spirit of the times, right? A time between say, tradition, modernity, um, France truly taking off in unprecedented way and having to cope with unprecedented problems. This is what we always have to rem remember in the art of war, that until things happen, nobody had done them um, to to an extent, like to, to the extent we see now by scale, and especially in this time, right? You know that they always try to, um, let's say, uh, demonize the, the concept of the military revolution, that is utter nonsense. But if there was any military revolution whatsoever during the modern era, um, excluding Napoleonic times that we're counting the contemporary one, like, it, it wasn't the Renaissance, it was, by scale, the second half of the 17th century in proportion.
It's not to say that, of course, like there weren't different levels of what was going on, that the relative terms are also important, but I mean, what was achieved in terms of the building of the actual later modernity and contemporaneity does start from, from this time, largely. Uh, you would have not seen armies of the size of the Spanish at the war of Spanish succession until the Napoleonic ones, for example. So um, there is really when actually fortresses would have, like at least during the 19th century, been surpassed conceptually in many ways. But uh, let's say that um, this all connects with the rest because in response to Vauban's, um, you know. Uh, insights, achievements, and, and, and genius, uh, more formidable artillery fortifications were developing, and including the ones that would bring later Vauban's fortifications themselves to succumb right, uh, to the substantially enhanced firepower of the latter half of the 19th century, um, just as the medieval castle had been rendered obsolete by the introduction of gunpowder, well, it took some time before that came to fruition, but you can argue that here was like just a bit the same, and also in an age in which, um, in fact, the development in artillery was it was not so radical as we think, um, actually. In fact, it's uh, overrated, at least to the extent that, the, again, the technologistic pyrotechnicism of the military revolution wants to make you believe, but that Say makes Vauban's legacy until the mid nineteenth century sort of very very um, uh, long living, given the the circumstances. Very well. Uh, I'm glad we took, could talk about this. Take it just as an introduction to Vauban's work. I don't know how often we will keep looking at his work, but uh, the also the treatises are very very fascinating um, in any case let's add this to our Grand Siècle playlist uh, for today I however stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.